Are you folks doing tonight? It's May 19th, uh, May, excuse me, May 21st, 2018. Calvin Castine at the Clint County Historical Association Museum. And we're here for a loser, loser presentation. Well, somebody's going to tell us all about the history of the Lozier Motor Works, which happened right here in Plattsburgh. Dick Soper, are we only going to talk about Plattsburgh, or are we going to talk we're, about where We're going to talk about uh, Detroit. We're going to talk about Cleveland, Ohio. We're going to talk about the products they made. Some people don't realize all the number of products they made. They made uh, sewing machines. They made bicycles, uh, boats here in Plattsburgh, and eventually on automobiles. And we're going to talk about beyond there. About the who? about the Lozier Company oh. and the family and okay. how they all related here, some of the people here, prominent people here in town that were involved in it. Because a lot of people don't realize why did the most expensive car in the world land in Plattsburgh? And that's part of what this is all about. <laughs> Our little old town of uh, 18,000 people had the most expensive car on the face of the earth <laughs> at one time. So we out cadillac the Cadillac. We exactly did that. Cadillac <laughs> wasn't even out when they first came out. Yep. Yeah, you know, you think of Rolls Royce now, and you think of uh, expensive vehicles. But yeah. uh, they came out in 1907, so the beat them to the punch already, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're gonna have how about how long is your presentation? It's gonna be about a little over an hour, probably closer to an hour and a half. Okay. Well, unfortunately, it depends if uh, how many questions and so on. But so people can interrupt you and they can, yeah, we, they can ask questions because it's with a presentation like this. Uh, it, to try to remember what happened an hour earlier is a little difficult, so absolutely. Okay, now you're here at the Clinton County Historical Association, but this isn't where you uh, no, usually I hang am, your hat, is I it? I am director of the Champlain Valley Transportation Museum next door, right over behind <laughs> us here, where we have the home tour for two loggers. Uh, we have a loggia boat, we have three loggia bicycles, two marine engines, and I have a, a very expensive loggia engine all taken apart, so you can see how the roller bearings worked in it and so on. I can still remember that day when the Lozier arrived in Plattsburgh. It was a joyous day, wasn't it? Well, to be honest, yes, absolutely it was. Uh, when, you know about when the company right. arrived here, yes, absolutely. No, no, when they, when they uh, restored Lozier. Arrived. Okay, yeah. well, I wasn't here, believe it or not. Oh, okay. No, I was living in Connecticut, and I first found out about Lozier at the Bill Hara Car Museum. That is basically how I found out about it which is way over in Reno, Nevada. That's how I first <laughs> found out about Lozier, and I was, I'm a Plattsburgh native, so that was, that was a, a revelation to me to hear about Lozier. <laughs> all right, and now you're going to have a revelation for all of us. That's right. <laughs> all right, yeah. thanks, Nick. You're welcome. How are you doing? Welcome to the Clinton County Historical Association. It's really our pleasure um, to again to... Uh, to welcome Dick. He, he spoke to us uh, in, in early January or middle January on the history of the Lozier family and the company in Plattsburgh. He has wonderful, um, a wonderful presentation for you. Just um, a little background. Um, he served in the U.S. Air Force, uh, stationed in Germany in the field of communications. He was born in Plattsburgh. And uh, it says here he has vast experiences, and you'll probably share that, in the area of transportation. Included uh, work at Pratt & Whitney Aircraft in Connecticut, where he built jet aircraft engines. He also uh, worked at Bombardier uh, Transportation, building passenger rail cars. Uh, the past 11 years, and we are, come on in. <laughs> we are very privileged to have him working next door. Uh, at the Transportation Museum, which is one of the uh, great museums on the Old Base Museum campus. It's one of four. Um, and there, the special treat is the uh, restored Lozier, 1915, Type 82, seven-passenger touring car. So, welcome, Dick, thank and you. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Everybody here be okay? You're welcome to sit up in front here if you'd like. A uh, couple things. That, first of all, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Clinton County Historical for providing the venue for this. Uh, also, Helen uh, Nerska uh, did the presentation for me. I've never done a PowerPoint, so uh, she helped me. I supplied some of the photos. She supplied a lot of additional ones, too. And uh, the Clinton County Historical has also cooperated very nicely with us um, uh, in donating a number of things, and I will point some of these out. One thing is a Lozier Marine engine that they donated to us. Uh, we'd also like to, like to welcome Calvin Castine. Uh, Calvin and um, uh, Gordy Little have uh, come to the museum before uh, a number of times and done presentations. 
um, and uh, we welcome him again. So this will be uh, online available eventually. Uh, also, we've had, just so you know, if you're also looking for, if somebody's out of town and you're looking to uh, find out more information, especially on video, PBS Mountain Lake uh, Channel 57 uh, did a uh, presentation on it that lasted, uh, it's just 26 minutes, it took seven and a half hours of filming for the TV crew and I've got that presentation. So if they're out of town, they can always go to pbs.org and look that up. Uh, Derek Mirden is the one that put that together for us. Um, uh, anyway, uh, back to Lozier and the company. Now, one of the things about Lozier that I wanted to, uh, that was very, very important is who are these people? Why did they come to Plattsburgh? Why did, how did this company arrive here? What did they make? How did they get up to this point? So we're going to start here first with this gentleman right here. This is Henry Abram Lozier. If you're a historian, one of the things you do is, this name is very important that you, you know who this person is. Uh, the problem is he had a son that was Henry Abram Lozier Jr. He didn't want to be called Jr., so he changed his name to Harry. Oh. So you will occasionally see Henry Abram Lozier, uh, Hen Harry Abram Lozier Sr., there's no such person. Uh -huh. See what I'm saying? So this, if you're looking up the facts, this is one of the things you'll run into. So this is the founder of the company. Um, he was born on uh, August 15th, 1846. He died May 25th, uh, 1903 at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City at age 57. Uh, this is his wife, Mary Lozier. You can tell they're very elegant people. You can see her uh, dressed up in her beautiful clothing. She was born uh, January 4th, 1842. She was actually four years older than her husband. Uh, she died uh, December 12th of 1906 at age 64. Uh, this is the son, uh, and this is a recent photo that uh, Clinton County Historical found. Uh, this is Harry. We'll just call him Harry from here on in. He's, like I said, he's a uh, junior, actually, but uh, we just call him Harry. Now, this is the gentleman who was responsible for the car, and I'll get more into that a little bit later. Uh, he was born on September 8th, 1867. Uh, he died December 26th, one day after Christmas in 1926, at the age of 59. Notice these ages here. They're, they're dying very young uh, at the time here. Now, there were other Lozier family. I'm just going to briefly mention them. There was Elizabeth. Uh, she was born on December 5th, 1869. Uh, now, uh, I just talked before about we saw Mary Lozier. Uh, she was from a Scottish family. Okay, the, uh, the, um, the, they were Thomases, but uh, they're, they're Edward Ross Thomas, for example, was her brother. Uh, she named, on her part of the family, she named the last two children uh, on, her mother's, on, the, on the mother's side. Uh, her, his name, uh, the fourth son, or the third son, uh, was Edwin Ross Lozier, born in 1872, died in 1864 at age 51. And the last one was Edwin, uh, Joseph Edward Lozier. He was born in 1880. Now, um, this is John Perrin, and John Perrin was responsible for a number of things. Mr. Lozier, was, it was important to him to have quality, that whatever was going into this product, his name, this name Lozier, he was very concerned about the, the uh, quality of the product and the durability of the product. This is the man that was responsible for getting to that point. He was the chief engineer for Lozier. He believed in roller bearings, if you know what they are, they make things spin very, very easily. And I call him the roller bearing man, I kind of joke, joke with him. Uh, he was born um, in 1884, I didn't have the exact date, but he died in 1967 at age 83. And by the way, uh, when he was here in Plattsburgh, he lived, if you know where the public library is, and on Brickerhoff Street, the house right behind it. That's where his home was, right there. So we know where he lived. Uh, so this is the chief engineer. Now, the company uh, will go back to 1880 with their first product they made, sewing machines, the New Home Sewing Machine Company. And this is an actual little postcard uh, from this date, from around 1880. And you can see the Lozier and Stokes wholesale dealers and this is their treadle sewing machine. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very popular. Uh, their sewing machines had decreased in size, <laughs> and it were now moved into the home, and they were very popular for people that like to, to create clothing and, and uh, fix clothing. Uh, look on the bottom, you see the advertising. I love this advertising. It says, I will have a new home sewing machine, a new home or a divorce, or a divorce sir, take your choice. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting advertising here. This is another one here that shows uh, sister, what are the wild waves saying? 
Uh, brother, this patch was put on by the light running new home sewing machine. <laughs> so interesting advertising. Again, this is from around 1880. Uh, they, uh, Henry Lozier at this point in time had worked originally for the general agent uh, for the new home sewing machine company in Toledo, Ohio. And we're going to see pictures of the plant here in a few minutes. Uh, he joined another gentleman named Henry uh, uh, Joseph Yost, uh, and they produced uh, these, uh, originally started producing these sewing machines 1880 to around uh, 1889. Uh, in 1887, he started selling bicycles on the side, and two years later joined forces with another sewing machine dealer, Mr. Yost. Together they purchased the new home uh, sewing machine factory, changing the name to the Lozier and Yost Manufacturing Company. In 1889, they changed the factory over to bicycle production, and in 1891, they incorporated the Lozier and Yost Seamless Tubing Company. Okay, so uh, the bicycles were called, their, well, their bicycle was called uh, the Lozier and Yost Little Giant, and we do have one in our museum. It's a ladies' bike, it's very fragile, uh, but it's a very interesting uh, looking bike, and it is adjustable, uh, so the young girl could ride it right until she became an adult. Uh, in uh, 1891, Henry uh, bought out, Henry Lozier bought out uh, Mr. Yost's interest in the company and renamed the company the Lozier Manufacturing Company to produce the new Cleveland Bicycle. This is really important, an important change. This is the company, look at the size of that building. Uh, this is in Toledo, and uh, this, uh, you can see the, the smokestacks and so on blowing out black smoke, which would not be very friendly in today's environment, but uh, this is what the company looked like. Now, the important thing was right there, Mr. L Mr. Lozier almost immediately started selling these bicycles all over Europe. He had a huge chain of uh, sales agents through all the major cities in Europe. And we actually have two of these bicycles on exhibit. This particular one here is from 1895. And you see the first in quality and makes the best of cycles, ease, pleasure, business, and social enjoyment. Um, the advertising, like I said, in this stuff is kind of interesting. Um, this ad right here shows a young lady. Uh, this is called the Little Giant, and you can see her the Cleveland, and you can see her in her level dress and her high heels, <laughs> stepping over the stones with her very little lightweight uh, one-pound bicycle. It kind of makes it look that way. Of course, it isn't. Uh, but this is a Cleveland bike, and this is how they advertised back in the day. Now they had other ways of advertising, and one of the things that they did is they showed how durable these bikes could be. And this is one of the ways. This is an actual ad from 1899. Uh, this gentleman is Joseph Grimes. I guess he was a wrestler. He weighed 575 pounds and he's riding the Cleveland bicycle. Uh, this is an actual ad. Like I said, this is not something we made up. This is an ad from uh, 1899. Uh, so the bike, bicycles were very sturdy and we have one of these bicycles identical to what he's riding uh, in our uh, Lozier Gallery over here at the museum. So uh, <clears throat> the bicycle bicycles, like I said, were sold throughout Europe. The very last year in 1897 that he had the company, he actually shipped 22,000 bicycles to Europe. So the name is spread throughout the whole company. Now, um, they decided at some point in time to sell uh, all of the interest in all of the bicycles because they were, uh, they were available, bicycles were getting available by a number of different companies. They sold it to the American Bicycle Company, which eventually became Columbia. Now the sale in the resulted in Mr. Lozier putting four million dollars in his pocket in 1897, which in today's dollars that's 50 million dollars. Mm -hmm. So the company was immediately very wealthy uh, from that sale. Uh, they made an agreement though to lease a portion of the foundry uh, for manufacturing experimental marine engines. Now the first design that they did in Toledo was a one-cylinder, two-cycle, three-horsepower engine and Clinton County Historical has uh, donated one to us. Uh, we have the little uh, three, one cylinder action that was made here in Plattsburgh. They started the experimental engines uh, in Toledo. Uh, at the same time, they met uh, Mr. Burwell, who was the uh, plant manager and general superintendent. Uh, he uh, was a boater and uh, he uh, was interested in uh, engineering and in how boats were built because boats mostly all made out of wood at the time. So he located this gentleman named Scott Matthews who made very high quality boats in Bascom, Ohio. In 1898, the two companies entered an agreement in which the Matthews built boats from 16 to 45 feet long would use Lozier engines and the whole product would be named the Lozier Boat. Okay, that's how the name started. 
This new venture required a large facility for production, and Mr. Lodger started looking for a suitable location. The Toledo area was experiencing a great deal of labor strife, and the search was on. Mr. Burwell, now I'm going to stop just for a minute, and uh, I want to give uh, talk about things here that happened in Plattsburgh. Uh, George Burwell, I'll talk a little bit about him. Uh, in the late 1800s to 1900, three factors happened uh, simultaneously that resulted in Lozier coming here to Plattsburgh. Number one, the prominent businessmen of Plattsburgh were in search of a major industry to provide long-term employment for the vast amount of workforce left without jobs as the mining and lumber industry was beginning to fade away. There were lots of iron mines around and competition. Mr. Smith M. Weed, which you probably have heard if you're history, into history here, happened to meet with Mr. Lozier in New York City on one of his frequent trips, and it happened to be at the time that Mr. Lozier was looking to relocate his total business interest from Toledo to, for the labor problems. Thus, Mr. Weed, uh, being one of the successful Plattsburgh businessmen, was instrumental in getting Lozier interested in the Plattsburgh area as a possible site. Uh, Mr. Lozier's superintendent of operations at his Toledo factory was Mr. Burwell, who I mentioned previously. It so happened that Mr. Bur Burwell was very uh, familiar with the Plattsburgh area as he resided here for a period of two and three quarter years while, uh, while he was in the area. Uh, he was the superintendent of the Williams Typewriter Factory, which was located on Pine Street down by the police station. So if that long flat area where the parking lot is, that was the Williams uh, Typewriter Company. Mr. Lozier made several trips to Plattsburgh to survey the area and to meet with local businessmen who formed a committee to try to convince Mr. Lozier to lo relocate. The re re our efforts were rewarded as in June of 1900, Mr. Lozier announced that Plattsburgh would be the home of the new Lozier Manufacturing Company. The preceding months before Mr. Lozier's decision, the, uh, the prominent business people, along with some of the citizens of, <coughs> excuse me, of Plattsburgh, had pledged various amounts of money. This is kind of interesting. Uh, to try to convince Mr. Lozier to relocate to Plattsburgh. Uh, at the time of Mr. Lozier's announcement, the amount pledged totaled $104,750. So Mr. Lozier, despite the fact that he was wealthy and the company was wealthy, he wanted an interest here in Plattsburgh. If I'm going to locate here, we need you to step to the plate, and this is how they did it. Mr. George Tuttle was appointed chairman of a five-person committee for the Stockholders Association, and Mr. Lozier had pledged to match dollar for dollar every amount that they raised here in Plattsburgh. In early June of 1900, the Stockholders Committee met with Mr. Lozier to discuss a possible site. There were three locations. The first was called the Anderson Farm, which is where Georgia Pacific is currently located right now. The second was an island in the mouth of the Saranac River. It's not there anymore. So it's a good thing it wasn't put there because it apparently washed away, evidently. And the third area was known as the South Dock, which was basically where the, uh, the marina is now uh, in, in Plattsburgh here. Uh, Mr. Lozier had secured an option on the Anderson Farm. That seemed to be his interest uh, with the owner. Uh, and that would expire on August the 6th of 1900. So they had to make their mind up and get things going. Mr. Lozier also stated as a meeting that the ultimate decision for the location would rest entirely with Mr. Burwell as he would be the superintendent of the factory. So here's a man trusting this man to do his part of the deal. He had already previously worked for him. Mr. Lozier went on to state, this is kind of ironic, that the company could not afford to pay anything for the site. Uh, the site by the time the electricity is turned on, we will have spent $50,000. Now again, Plattsburgh didn't know the background here. The Anderson farm, farm property consisted of 285 acres, much of which was lowland and flooded from the lake at certain times of the year. Mr. Uh, Weed estimated there were about 100 acres of good land that could be bought for $11,000. He also stated that any property not used for the factory could be sold as building lots, recouping some if not all of the purchase price. Uh, at this meeting, Mr. Lozier announced that the contract for the dam and powerhouse at Indian Rapids, I'll explain that in just a minute, uh, uh, was awarded to Dennis Callahan of Plattsburgh for the amount of $19,818. A lot of money back then, uh, so you can see that the, the contract. Both the dam and the powerhouse would be built of concrete. The contract for the electrical machinery would be let in a few days. The powerhouse will consist of two generators of 500 horsepower each and a trans transmission line carrying a current of 10,500 volts to the shops where it will be turned uh, transformed to 240 volts for the purpose of running the machinery. And this is a drawing of the factory, or of the uh, power, uh, powerhouse. Now, if you uh, are curious about where this is, 
If you go around route, go to the airport and start following your way around Route 22, on the right hand side there's a memorial to the encampment there. Mm -hmm. And if you go follow the guardrails down, there's an opening. Just go down that road. It's a fishing hole there, and this whole plant is still there. Mm -hmm. I only found this out last year. So uh, this is uh, the, if you if right here. If you don't want to go down through there, this is where the Northway currently crosses. So if you go across the Northway heading north and you look to your right, you'll actually see the opening of the dam right here. So this is uh, the dam. Uh, so I'm going to run through, these are actual current photos taken last year of the dam. Like I said, the whole thing is there. You're looking to the south, the dam is to the right, and this is the powerhouse that went up several stories. Uh, I can bring it back just a little bit if you want to see it. See the building there on top? So that was probably a two-story building. That's where all the generators were. Uh, and this is the base of the building, the concrete you see. And that's the sluice way, I think is what they call you that. You see the arches where, they, where it came out. Right, the exit of the, the water coming out right there. And you see the fishermen go up and they fish in this area all the time. So these are current photos. I'll just run them through fairly quick. Uh, that's one of the output to one of the... I think that's the... the uh, like an emergency spillway, mm -hmm. but you can see uh, close-up pictures. That's all there. Uh, I don't know if they actually purposely blew that out uh, of the center to let the water through, but uh, they're still pretty good. They said the fishing is really good up here on the upper part of it. So this is all what we have currently for the uh, Lozier factory. Is this Our, the uh, the Saranac? Pardon me. Is this the Saranac River? Saranac River. Yeah. Like I said, right up, if you watch the Northway, you go across the Northway. Yeah, okay. You go to the mobile station and take go north. Mm -hmm. You can see it over there on the right. This is some of the equipment coming out. I'm not sure what this is. It looks like a shaft and some other things going in there. Uh, and here's your walkway when they go up and do the fishing. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the blades that would be lifted, lowered, and upper and, and down to let the water through. Uh, and uh, so that's the powerhouse. Now, one of the interesting things is there were some articles in the Press Republican where people were terrified because they had right down Beekman Street, they had this 10,000 volt line running through and it used to hum. And uh, just like the rumors came out that when the windmills came up here in Plattsburgh that the cows would stop milking and the birds were all going to die and all this stuff was going to happen, it was the same thing back then. It turned out not to be a problem and it turned out it produced so much voltage that actually the city ended up buying it to help run the trolley cars. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so uh, we're going to give you some press uh, releases. On the Plattsburgh Daily Press, September 4th, 18, uh, or 1900, Amelia, a Amelia A. Anderson and others sold to the larger Motor Company village property for $1 and other considerations. The money they got was stock in the larger factory. So you can see the commitment came, here came the money, and now came uh, people in Plattsburgh that started owning the company. Uh, September 21st, 1900, ground is broken for the larger Boathouse, which is located right up here on the top. Make sure I push. This is the boathouse here. Now, what you see here, this is basically Cumberland Avenue here. This is Margaret Street heading north here, and this is this is Boynton Avenue. There is no road there, and all and almost all the slides I have, it's nothing but the dirt road, dirt area beside the plant. Is all it is. So this is the boathouse. Um, and that uh, rail line going into it. That rail line was there, yeah, that was part of the plan. They brought the, the thing in. What it used to do, it brought in raw materials and wood. The boats were made out of wood and they were brought in. Uh, the lower building right here, this building here was the foundry. I've, I've got close-ups of it. Uh, this is the, basically the foundry and the woodworking shop. So the wood was cut here. And what would happen is they actually had a rail yard, you'll see, that went over here to the, this is the heating plant. So any scrap wood was burned in the heating plant. And... Uh, this over here, this is the work of the, uh, the uh, fabrication shop over here, which we'll see that in a little bit later. Okay, so contracts were awarded for the machine shop and the foundry buildings. Completed for these two buildings would be co would cost about, the completed cost was 31000 or in the neighborhood of 43000 for the entire plant, including the bowl house. This is the initial expense. Uh, Plattsburgh Sentinel, October 12, 1900. The Lozier Motor Company prior preparing a temporary headquarters in the Williams Sewing Machine Works. So they rented a section in there until all this operation here got, got built. Okay, um, here is a, an example here of the, uh, this is the wood, woodworking shop and the foundry over here. Uh, and you can see over here the railroad tracks are currently still there. And again, you don't see Boynton Avenue here. It's, it's just a, a dirt area of the, of the factory there. Now this is one of the earliest pictures of the boathouse. Uh, 
People uh, have always said that it looks like it's falling over because you, if you look at it from one side, it's a crane like this. And it's designed this way so the building doesn't fall over in the wind. Uh, you can see here there's wood, some sort of wood siding on it, lots of windows, and what you have is a train or a crawly that runs, a trolley that runs across the inside of it. And we'll continue here. Now this is a picture of the boats being built. Uh, we have the same boat that you see on the, uh, the uh, rail car. Now, of course, the boats were built. All the boats were shipped down. The closest place you could build buy a larger boat would be in Albany. There was a dealership down in Albany. Most of them were sent to New York City. Uh, the one on the ground over here is a little bit bigger one to the left over this. this oops. Sorry about that. Uh, the one over here on the left, uh, the lower one here, this is a much bigger one. You can see it with the Surrey with the fringe on top. Uh, so that's another version of the, of the boat. Okay, what happened here? Okay. Um, this is the heating plant. Uh, again, well, the, the wood was brought over here. Uh, heat provided for the whole facility over here. Uh, this is the, uh, the woodworking foundry from looking northwest, this would be. And you can see all the power lines coming into the building and the smokestacks and so on. Uh, this is another example of it. And you're stand you see the tracks current turning around here? Uh, this You're standing virtually on Margaret Street looking right into the front of that building. The building is still there today. If you look at it, there's a digester or something in front of it, but that building still exists today. Uh, this is the interior of it. You can see the big buckets here that would pick up. They made a lot of aluminum here. The oil pans were aluminum. Uh, the heads were all cast iron. And this is a photo of the interior of the foundry. Uh, now this is the machine shop that was started in 1905. And I have several pictures of the interior there. Uh, I'm going to stop just at the moment here and tell you a little bit more about Mr. Lozier. So Henry Lozier moved to New York City to establish a sales headquarters with the new showroom on the East River where the new boats were on display and a boathouse with Bo Lozier launches tied up to docks ready for a demonstration ride. By the way, these boats were $1,500. This is back in the day when a house was $3,000 and the average person made about $400 a year. So these are very high-end boats. Henry lived with his wife Mary in a luxurious suite at the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, the larger marine engines were shipped and sold throughout the world. Uh, they could be found in Egypt, China, Japan, India, England, Scotland, Sweden, and Australia. So you can see the, he had already spread this huge net around the world uh, to sell the products, and the bicycles were sold in a lot of those markets too. A sad thing happened on May the 25th, 1903. Henry Lozier died at his apartment at the Waldorf. Uh, this is his obituary, I'll read to you. Uh, May 26, 1903, the day after he died. Henry A. Lozier, ex-president of the Cleveland Bicycle Company, died suddenly from a heart failure yesterday noon in his 66th year of his age. That is not correct. He was 57. But I'm reading the news uh, as it says. Though, though feeling unwell yesterday morning, Mr. Lozier refused the services of a physician as he did not believe his condition was serious. Mr. Lorger was born in Dearborn County, Indiana. When the bicycle industry was in its infancy, he entered the field by purchasing a sewing machine plant in Toledo, Ohio, and making the bicycles there. He later established factories in other cities, and at one time employed over 4,000 men. Men, there were women too. As the industry declined, he directed his energies into other lines. He was also president of the, uh, and director of the Boulay Spectacular Art Company. Don't even know what the, who they were. Okay, so in 1905, uh, you can see now Mr. Lozier has died. He was really opposed to the automobile. Back in 1903, before he died, cars were very undependable. They were extremely expensive. You almost had to have your own mechanic slash driver to get around in them, and he just felt they were vile. He didn't want his name on one. However, Mr. Birdwell, uh, they had hired John Perrin, and uh, the rest of the, and, and uh, of course, uh, Harry, decided that this is the way to go. We need to get into the auto industry. It's going fast. We need to get onto the bandwagon. So in 1905, this building here was completed, along with all the sub-assemblies you see over here, uh, over here on the right-hand side of it here. And notice that Margaret Street's dirt. Mm -hmm. Again, paving didn't occur in the United States until 1915. Mm -hmm. uh, Woodward Avenue in Detroit was the first one to, uh, uh, to be paved. Uh, Lozier cars were built from 1905 to 1915, and with the death of his father, Harry Lozier, George Burwell, and John Perrin had to decide the future of the company. Harry, Henry had long opposed the production of the automobile, citing problems with early cars and questioning the re results of placing the Lozier name on a product that required a mechanic. 
After a meeting of the Board of Directors, it was decided with intensive research was required to obtain the finest quality materials and proceed with the development of the automobile. George Burwell and John Perrin set out to scour Europe to find out how other manufacturers had been injured in their cars and began to set standards for their own product. He knew, his father told me, product has to have quality and elegance and has to be worth the price. So they set out uh, to Europe uh, to see how other companies were doing. There was a perception here in the United States that everything that was better was made over in Europe. Mm -hmm. And they had to disprove this. So they went to Europe. Um, John Perrin in particular went to uh, find out how Mercedes were put together. Uh, he, it was determined by him that these were the finest quality automobiles available at the time and with a base price of $3,000 these were the most expensive cars. He went undercover to work on Mercedes cars and sent the results back to the United States. I have his micrometers. He measured all the parts of these Mercedes cars. He sent letters back here to uh, a production set here in Plattsburgh, or in uh, actually Connecticut where they were building a prototype and all this information resulted in the first product that they built here which was the first larger car. The goal was to produce an automobile that was equal in quality and value to the finest European designs. Harry had the assurance from Mr. Bird, Burwell and Perrin that the final product would make his father proud. Work on the first uh, larger car was done in a small Stanford, Connecticut machine shop, so the introduction of the car would be a surprise to the automotive world. 1905, the prototype car was brought to the Madison Square Garden Auto Show in 1905. Uh, I'm going to stop here just for a minute. We'll go back to these in a minute. I'll give you the background of the car. Um, the first car, 1905. Unlike Cadillac and Packard, which featured a one-cylinder engine, it had a four-cylinder engine, 115-inch wheelbase and 36-inch wheels. It featured an aluminum body and dimensions that were larger than most all, any other vehicles on the, on the road. This car was called the Model B, and the base price was $4,500. Totally outrageous. Nobody had ever produced a car this expensive. Virtually every part possible was produced at the Plattsburgh factory. They did have to import some of the lighting and so on and so forth, but most everything was uh, the high quality materials. Krupp steel was imported from, from Germany. Bosch magnetos were imported. Uh, ignition equipment and carburetors came from France. Each automobile was driven 500 miles through the demanding Adirondack Mountains for break-in and then disassembled and reassembled again to assure the best in reliability. Amazing that these cars were ready for the owner as soon as they were done. Then the complete cars were shipped by train to New York City and New Jersey where the finest and custom coach work was installed before shipping to showrooms. A total of 25 cars were produced in 1905. So now I'm just going to go quickly through this. Uh, this of course is the picture of the machine shop and this gentleman here, this picture was taken in 1905. You can see this is his office over here on uh, this upper picture here. This is the interior of the machine shop. Uh, again, you had big electric motors running all these uh, these belt-driven machinery here. Uh, this is another picture of the of the other side of the machine shop and all the workstations. Uh, so this is not the, exactly the assembly line, but it's this is what they call subassembly, which uh, other companies were using. Dick, uh, yes. Uh, in 1905, what, who would be uh, other competitors at the time, or who were they? Well, uh, Packard was up and running. Uh, Cadillac was producing cars, but they were not in the price range that Lozier was. There was nobody to rival Lozier. And that 4000 5000 up, this was it. This was all there was. Rolls-Royce didn't come into the picture until 1907. Ford was up and running, and again, his cars were in the $800 range. Uh, there were a bunch of companies. This was a lucrative thing for all these companies. So this is the beginning of our big current auto industry. Uh, again, this is on the inside of that factory. Uh, you can see here, I believe these are still some boat items. They did build boat motors up until 1907, although no boats were built. So the engines were still, there was big demand in Europe, particularly in Venice, for larger boat engines. So this is the interior of, the, of that office, and that guy's office is on the upper right corner up there that I was just talking. Now remember I mentioned the crane, you see this crane across the roof here, that rolls the whole length of the building, and as you can see they've got an item going left and right so you can pick up anything from any area. And notice the wood floor, this is very common in most factories. Like I said, I worked at Bombardier, most of the, the now they have concrete, but I worked at Pratt Wedding, everything is wood. This way if you drop a valuable tool, it's less of a chance of breaking it or damaging it. Here is a picture, uh, this is again Margaret Street, on the right over there is the boathouse. On the left, uh, this would be the, uh, the edge of the factory, 
And right over there, well, let's see if I get my, every time I touch this pointer, I hit the wrong button. But anyway, right here, this is the house that they built for the Lozier headquarters here in Plattsburgh. And the thing that's really weird about it, I, I only saw pictures of them from the south side. And Helen found a picture at one time, uh, one of the group uh, pictures that she got, and the north side was identical, so it was like a mirror of itself. I don't know why. And uh, you could just barely see on the top the widows walk up there mm -hmm. because the boats were brought out on the lake, and they wanted to see where these boats were. They could see from the, uh, the factory there. Uh, and this is a better picture of the house with the widows walk on the top. Uh, this building is all there. All the, all the windows are bricked in. So if you step, go up on Market Street and you look to your west in there, that's uh, this building. These are just additional pictures. Uh, this is the three horsepower marine engine that was built in Plattsburgh originally when the boats got going. Um, this was donated by Clinton County Historical to, to our museum, one of the earliest uh, items that we had in. This is a three horsepower engine, two cycle, one cylinder engine. And we have the boat that this belongs in, and uh, you'll see that in just a minute. Here's the boat that, that would be, this would belong in. This is a 1900 Lozier 22 footer. Uh, that's on loan to our museum, and this was built right here in Plattsburgh. It would have also had, on the side, it would have had two posts going up that were brass with a, a brass frame with a surrey on the fringe on top. That keeps the sun off you when you're out on the lake, and the, 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 surrey ke the, the fringe keeps the uh, bugs away. Uh, this is the largest of the engine. This is a 30 horsepower marine engine. Uh, this thing is monster. It's 2,000 pounds. Uh, this is the only one known to exist today, and we have this at the museum on exhibit too. This would be used on a boat around 50 feet long. Uh, if you look over there, you can see the carburetor is all brass. Uh, and I've got the side open so you can see the roller bearings on the camshaft. Okay, so uh, the first car, uh, uh, the first one introduced, we believe, I think personally, that this is the, one of the first completed Lozier cars uh, right in 1905. None of them exist today. This is one thing that's interesting. Also notice there's no windshield on it because glass was considered to be very unsafe. It would break, you, you just touch it the wrong way, it would break. And to put that right in front of your face in the car, you'll find very few cars equipped with windshields. Uh, if they did, they were kind of risky. Uh, but you can see the car is a chain drive car. This is the Briarcliff model, which would be a, a five passenger car. Now this is all they produced at the factory plant, at the plant here in Plattsburgh. Uh, the seats and everything you see that they're sitting on was put on each uh, chassis to break it all in. So like I said, they would take off down Route 9. I've got a whole store, a book on how they did this. They drove down Route 9, they got down to uh, Al Sable, they went across inland all the way up to Lake Placid, all through the mountains <laughs> to really test the engines, break them all in. Uh, we have a picture of the drivers that would do this. So the fenders are not part of the final car. I don't even believe the hood was. Uh, the headlights were probably taken off too, so this, this is how they broke it in, and you can see the, the headquarters right behind them. And here's a bunch of the test drivers. Uh, you see these outfits, it looks like a chitty chitty bang bang, but uh, uh, you can see the goggles they had because they didn't have any windshield. And you can see the, the, uh, the hood put on the car and very few instruments on the car. Uh, here's some dapper ladies at a completed Lozier, and again this is the first year. This would be a 1905 model, no windshield, uh, does have a top that would be put up. And notice right-hand drive. Virtually all cars in the United States were right-hand drive until the Model T Ford came out. They switched over to left. And this one is a seven-passenger. If you count everybody, you'll see uh, there, there's two jump seats in the middle, so this would be the largest car. Now, uh, this is another example. Uh, this, one, this model right here has something really interesting in it, uh, and that you'll see this a little bit later. If you look at the car and you follow the running board up, you see this weird-looking little thing right here on the left-hand side. That's the chauffeur seat. These cars were owned by millionaires. And if the chauffeur, let's say the gentleman and, and uh, a banker in downtown New York City wanted his car, the chauffeur would deliver it to him. After the families on the car, the chauffeur sits on the running board. This is called the chauffeur seat. And you see this on a number of cars. Uh, and this, again, is a little bit newer model. You see skirts here on the side. Uh, you can see by the dirt in the wheel wells that these were called mud guards originally. They weren't called fenders. Uh, but this is, uh, this one right here I believe is a, probably a 19, oh, I think this is a 1905 model. Now, I'm going to stop just for a minute. In 1975, uh, I was working at the time for Pratt Whitney Aircraft in Connecticut. I bought a brand new motorhome and I decided to go out west, my first big trip out west. I went to Reno, Nevada, and I stopped at the Bill Hara Car Museum. 
to 1,600 cars and no air conditioning in these buildings. I saw every car in there and I'm going through all of these cars and I stopped and I saw this car and when I read the sign I almost fell over. A 1906 Lozier built in Plattsburgh, New York. And it's like, what? I've never, I graduated from PHS, my mother graduated from PHS, my father graduated from MAI, never heard of this before. Uh, I show you the next picture here. You can see another gentleman looking at it. There you can see the car was $5,500. Now there are no 1905 Lozier's that have ever been found. Uh, so if you find one, you got, you're a millionaire if you can find the car, if anything exists. So what I did, <coughs> when I got to a campground, I called my mother Collect. Uh, she told me ahead of time if there was any problems. We didn't have cell phones in those days. And I said, I, this is not an emergency, but I said, I'm dumbfounded. What is a Lozier car? And there was silence on the phone. I said, well, would you tell Dad? My father was a city fireman. Would you find out from him? What is this Lozier car business? Uh, she did eventually find out. He didn't know anything about it either. So it started a quest for me. What is going on with this Lozier car? Anyway, this is the only 1906 Lozier in existence. It is now in a private collection in New Jersey, and it is for sale. Uh, the price of this car would be totally astronomical. Uh, but like I said, I happen to see it at the Harb Museum. And it's, um, okay, so um, we'll get going down here a little further. I'm going to talk about the years and some of the cars. The 1906 uh, John Perrin design team uh, put a lot of engineering features on the car, and you're going to see later a little, uh, some of the things they did. The prices were $5,500 for the basic touring car, which is one you just saw. The limousine was $6,500. Again, this was into territory nobody had ever been. Uh, they sold 25 cars the first year, so it was successful. Uh, production in 1906 it, uh, got up to 56 cars, and they built a brand new showroom on 56th Street and Broadway uh, to sell the cars there. Uh, in 1907, a uh, new Model E was produced with a price tag of $7,000 for the touring car, $8,000 for the limousine. No resistance whatsoever to the price. Millionaires like what you can't afford. And they just bought them uh, enough to keep the company going and very, very successful. Uh, the new car was built on a 120-inch wheelbase, had a 60-horsepower engine, and to match the country club pricing, the car models were named after the affluent community, communities, clubs, hotels, and streets. Uh, they were called the Meadowbrook, the Lakewood, the Riverside, and the Knickerbocker. Obviously, I'm from the Knickerbocker Hotel. 1907 was Lozier's start with automobile racing. And here, the reason they did is because cars winning races sell lots of cars. And it does two things. It shows the durability of the car. So uh, they began uh, racing in closed tracks in 1907. The sport attracted the attention of many people and highlighted the abilities of the automobile uh, involved. Many were highly modified to, to add speed and durability, but the Lozier company wanted the car to be completely stock with no modifications other than removing bodywork. The first race involved Lozier's that took place in Point Breeze, Philadelphia, one mile horse racing track on June the 8th, uh, 28th and 29th of 1907. It was a 24 hour race, just like they race at the Le Mans race today. It started at noon on the 28th, ended at noon on the 29th. The dirt track turned into a sea of mud after raining for 10 hours of the 24 hours. Lozier entered two stock cars and won the race covering 717 miles in 24 hours. And again, this is the first big car race. Lozier won the first place. The drivers were Harry Michener and Ralph Mulford, and uh, I don't know which of the two cars. These are the Lozier cars. I'm not, I don't know who's who, but uh, anyway, this is the first race. Um, Lozier cars were involved in 21 major races from 1907 to the end of 1911. The most famous race was uh, the first Indy 500 held on Memorial Day, May 30th, 1911. 40 cars entered the speed. Uh, they had to qualify by averaging 75 miles around, mile around the Indy 500 track. When the checker flag dropped, the Lozier car was declared the winner. The second place car was a Marmon Wasp driven by Ray Haroon. He was an engineer with the Marmon Motor Company. And he protested, stating that there was a massive crash, a gentleman was killed, and uh, the Lozier car had passed during a pit stop. Nobody noticed it. They gave them the benefit of the doubt, because guess what? The Marmon Company car was built in Indianapolis, Indiana. So the whole boys did well, and Lozier was awarded second place. Still quite a feat. 
The winning car averaged 500 miles at an average speed of 74.47 miles an hour. Picture yourself getting in a car today on the Northway, going all the way down to New Jersey and averaging 74 miles an hour. And this is the car that did that. This is the uh, car that won second place. The race attracted 60,000 spectators. So Lozier was really put on the map with that number of people. Okay, so we're going to um, we're talk a little bit about something else different. And we're talking about cars, and I'm back to Mary Melissa Thomas Lozier. Again, this is another photograph. You can see how elegant she was. Her brother's name was Edwin Ross Thomas. And before, when the plant first got together, Mr. Thomas came over here and load, uh, laid the chassis for the first Thomas automobile. It was called the Thomas Flyer. Uh, his company was located in Buffalo, in Buffalo, but the company wasn't ready, so they laid the first chassis before the first loader went. So they had a, they were in cahoots with each other in terms of design. Now her brother decided the the Thomas car would enter a, a race. Uh, they didn't. They weren't called to do this. What happened is the race was called. Um, uh, it was called the Great Race, New York to Paris Automobile Race. Mm -hmm. The cars entered were from Germany, France, Italy, and nobody from the United States had entered. So, the President of the United States requested that somebody come up and enter an automobile. And it turned out that Mr. Thomas decided to enter the Thomas Flyer. Uh, the race was to be, this is how the race ran, and this is, the race was a 1907 car, Thomas Flyer entering. The race was held on in February, the date here, uh, February of 1908, February the 12th, 1908, when this race started. So you can see they started over here uh, in New York City. They uh, and this is in February in the winter time. Uh, crossings of the United States. Can you imagine then? There were no very few roads. No, no roads were paved. There were very few roads to start with. So they went from New York City to Chicago and then on to San Francisco. Then what they did is they drove up to Seattle. Now the plan was to go to, to go on a ship, because there's some places you can't, uh, there were no Canadian highways up through there. So what they did, they put it on a ship and they went up to Valdez, Alaska. And the idea was to continue on, they were going to drive up through Alaska, and right here at the Bering Strait, exactly. this was frozen normally during the winter time. Well, when they got up there, they found out, guess what? There was no telegraph or anything. To, they found out it wasn't frozen, so now we're going to do it. So back on a boat, all the way back to Seattle, and then they went on a ship to Yokohama, Japan. They ran across Japan. They entered Russia over here at Vladivostok. Now, keep in mind, their gas and stuff was waiting for them up over here in spare tires. So on they went uh, from Vladivostok. I can't even pronounce it. Irk, Irktusk, I guess. Irkutsk. Okay, thank you. Uh, Moscow, and then finally on to Paris. Now, a couple of facts here that are interesting. Uh, the U.S. portion of the race took 41 days. So from New York to San Francisco, 41 days, 8 hours, and 15 minutes from New York to San Francisco. The total race covered three continents and over 22,000 miles in 169 days. Uh, the race was ultimately won by the American-made Thomas Flyer, driven by George Schuster of Buffalo, New York. This feat has never been equaled, and they still hold the record 110 years down the road. So how did they get all the gas? Did that go by uh, railroad or something? But where did they go? How, how did all the gasoline... I don't know. There's okay. no explanation. You can look it up online and see. It's quite an explanation of how the, there, were, uh, there were cars around, I guess, in different places, but they had to stage this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how. I mean, there are no gas stations. Figure out how did they get food? I mean, there's lots of things. The race was, like I said, originally they were up in northern Russia, which must have been, it could have been pretty tough in the weather uh, up in the northern Russia. I mean, how they figured they'd get through here is totally beyond me. But I just wanted you to look at this race. This is an amazing feat. So we're going to uh, go through here and take a look. This is the start of the race in New York City. Uh, you can see the Thomas Flyer is the second car over. Um, this is the car, this is the Thomas, uh, and you see the boards here on top of the fenders, they brought them along, there was really no, you could take as much gas or as much you wanted to put on there, but the boards were for getting over some of the rough spots. Mm -hmm. And you can see the winter, it's winter here, you see this gentleman bundled up in his coat, but here off we go, this is the actual photograph of the car, uh, American flags on the back, so everybody knew who they were. Uh, not sure where this is, but uh, we, this uh, over here is uh, in Utica, so you can see the Didion, the French car with uh, chains on all four wheels. So you can picture just looking at the road what this was like. 
Now here's Valdez, Alaska. We see some young ladies getting in the car, I guess, to, and they drove the car for a little distance, but look at the snow and ice that they're on over here. So you can imagine, had they gone across and over to Russia, what that would have been like. Uh, here's the ship. They're all bound up here on the ship, getting ready to go across uh, to Japan. We've got some trumpets, I guess, over there to, to welcome them aboard. Uh, I don't know where this is. I, it looks like probably Mongolia or something. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't begin to tell you where it is, but uh, this is the Thomas uh, going across there. They're taking a little break here. Um, you can tell us, this is almost like the perils of Pauline. Look at this. They put the train on a flatbed car on some rails to get it over the top of this river or little stream here. Uh, here's the Thomas again going across. I guess they put rocks on the stream to try to get across it. I mean, this was a, a, a feat that was absolutely amazing. And this is the actual car. This I also saw at the Hara Museum. This is one of the most wonderful visits I've ever had to a museum. Uh, this is the actual car. It was, uh, uh, the car was uh, put to one side at one point in time and it started deteriorating. And uh, uh, the, uh, the museum actually did a restoration just to put everything back to make it operate. Uh, and this is exactly what the car looked like. Look at the, uh, the, you see the wood in here. What an amazing feat for 1908. This is what I want to impress on the, the ex extent they went through to try to uh, show how these things work. So this is a 1908 Lozier. Look at how beautiful and elegant this automobile is. Uh, this is a shaft drive model. They were available with, with the chain drive as well as shaft drive. Uh, this, of course, is a brass era car. You can see how beautiful uh, the details were of the brass. That's a 12. This, pardon me? That's a 12. Is it a 12? Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I guess no, I don't no, know. No, it's, it's a 1908, but it's, it's 12 cylinders. No, no, that's a, that's a 6. They never made a 12. This is a 6. Though, I, I bought the engine, oh, I can show you. They got double plugs. They have double plugs. The, okay. the pistons, the, the uh, cylinders were so large, they put two plugs on each one. Yeah. Okay, so this is a 1909 Lozier. Uh, this is actually belongs to a gentleman named Corey Coker. Uh, he runs a company. He produces tires for every old car you could possibly. He's bought up all the molds from most all the cars. And this is a the same car with the fenders pulled off. This is how they used to race these cars. Um, and you can see this is the Coker, Coker car. It is for sale, by the way. Okay, now uh, we get to 1910. 1910... Um, by the way, just as a note, uh, in 1910, there were 54 automobiles registered here in Plattsburgh, and four of them were Lozier's. Okay, I'm assuming Mr. Smith, we probably had one. I know the uh, Champlain Hotel had one, uh, and so on. Okay, so the, um, the problem they ran into in, by 19, uh, 1909 was they could not produce more than 500 cars a year. And they had showrooms all over the world, and they were demanding cars. Uh, they couldn't do it here in Plattsburgh. They went to New York City to borrow money. They were turned down by the bankers. They said, no, what, where is Plattsburgh? We've never heard of that. You need to go to Detroit. So uh, they did. Uh, what they ended up doing, I'm going to read this little press release about the new factory of the larger motor company in Detroit. I don't have a date here. I'm assuming this is 1910. The raising of the American flag on the administration building of the new, Lozier, new plant of the Lozier Company on Mack Avenue on Monday morning will mark the completion of the newest of Detroit's already large number of auto enterprises. This factory, which has been under construction since last May, this would be May 1910, so this has got to be 1911, will commence operations on Monday with a force of 450 men, which will be, they always refer to men, there were women working in the plant as well. Uh, which will be increased rapidly as possible until all departments are in full operation. The new plant is located at the Detroit Terminal Railroad, a site comprising 65 acres with a frontage of 800 feet on Mack Avenue. It was built to enlarge the manufacturing facilities of the larger company. All their work, and I'm reading the way they wrote it, all their work heretofore having been built in the plant in Plattsburgh, New York, the latter factory will continue to operate, will, but will only build complete units for use in the Detroit works, the latter being the only one in which completed cars will be turned out. The two factories at Detroit and Plattsburgh will have a combined output of 1,000 uh, cars for the upcoming season, all parts of which will be made from raw materials. The building comprising the Detroit factory are absolutely fireproof, constructed of steel and concrete, the flat slab trip of construction being employed for the first time in the auto industry. The architect and designer of one of the best known buildings were designed and the work was carried on under the personal supervision of Albert Kahn. If you know who he is, he was a, a prolific designer of large buildings. He actually built the, uh, designed the Ford Motor Company. Um, 
Okay, um, in 1911, and I'm going to be a little cheeky when I tell you about this, a five-ton truck was shown at the auto show, which was to be added to the product line, but despite 150 interested parties, the project was abandoned. Despite the new plant, sales failed, failed to increase, and much of the plant was idle. They're in trouble. Now, prior to uh, January 16th, when I gave the lecture, the truck has been lost to history. Nobody's ever seen it or heard about it, at least I never did, and I've never seen any references other than the fact that it was supposed to be this truck. Uh, 1912 brought, um, okay, so this, this, is the, this is the proposal of the Detroit factory. Mm -hmm. You can see the long assembly lines here, very modern. Uh, this is a drawing of the plant, the Lozier plant, the main administrative building on the front, again designed by Albert Kahn. Uh, this is an overhead view of what the whole operation would look like. Uh, and this shows the two factories, the lower one being in Plattsburgh. And you can see at this point in time, this would have been uh, 1910, uh, you'd see now all the additional buildings uh, that were here, uh, including, you can see Cumberland Avenue now matching up with uh, uh, Boynton Avenue. Uh, this right here is uh, one of the larger ads. We have a bunch of them in our larger gallery. Uh, if you take a look at it, you see people who are enjoying the car, very sporty out in the country. Now here's a 1910 Lozier. Now, uh, this particular car here is interesting because I ran across this car uh, at the Gilmore Museum, uh, which is in Detroit, or in, I'm sorry, in Michigan. It's uh, south of Detroit. And uh, this car here, when I was looking at it and photographing it, uh, it's a beautiful automobile. It says it was made in Detroit. And I, went to, and, and I was like, okay, this is a Detroit plant. Sounds like they unplugged the platform plant and dropped it over there. We're going to talk about that in a minute. The interesting thing is the owners of this car were on the Titanic. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually survived the crossing, the husband and wife, uh, and when they were when they came back by train, so they, they lived in the Cleveland area, and uh, they were they were met by their Lozier car. Now uh, this right here is a 1911 Lozier, and uh, this is kind of a, the colors were all custom built for each uh, person. Uh, this is all of green color is kind of interesting. It certainly would have been one of my first choices. But this car sold last year for $1.5 million at auction, to give you an idea. Now, this is one of, the, up to 1913, these are the big Lozers. The 1912s and older are the most valuable of all the Lozers. Um, let see a few details here on the back of the car. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting uh, ad here because there's the Champlain Hotel. Uh, Clinton Community College, and you can see the Lorgers in front, and they did have, I understand they had one Lorger that would go back and forth up to the hotel. Uh, 1912 model year brought a major change with the shift to left-hand drive. So now a Lorger enters the modern era with left-hand drive. The new car was called the Model 72 with a base price of $5,000 and a six-cylinder engine. The four-cylinder was dropped. 1912 to 1913 provided, provi provided to be a disastrous year uh, for the company. Henry Lozier in 1913 was ousted from his position as president and given a position on the board of directors. His replacement was Harry Jewett, one of the original Detroit investors. Mr. Jewett announced the introduction of a new car called the Model 77, which is our white car we have in the museum. The new car was called the Light 6 with an L head and 36 horsepower. The car had a bliss price of $3,250. You see what's happening. We're going downhill now. We no longer have this great big six with the bowler, roller bearings in it. Now we have a new lighter, uh, less expensive car. There was a demand for the Model 72, uh, the last of the grand Lozier's of the past. But right in the middle of production, Mr. Lozier resigned and was replaced by Joseph Gilbert, a general manager of the U.S. Tire Company. And immediately Gilbert switched to and demanded a new Ford rebuilt it was called the Type 84 with a price of $2,100. You see a pattern developing here? Mm -hmm. He also eliminated the Model 62, the last of the expensive line of cars. Uh, the last two years were 1914 and 1915. Cadillac introduced a new V8 engine with a price of $2,000. Lozier was trying to meet it, but they only had a six, a four-cylinder engine to go against Cadillac's eight-cylinder. There was competition from Cadillac, Packard, and other manufacturers. The loss of prestige with the new pricing structure and reduced production brought the company to the brink of bankruptcy. The Lozier company closed its doors in late August for reorganization, in quotes. 
every attempt was made to reopen, including trying to, to entice Henry Ford to take over. The Lozier would be the Lincoln we would have had today. Uh, they're still around, and Lozier isn't. Lozier was forced to declare insolvency, and a bankruptcy sale was set for February 4, 1915. A group of investors formed the Association of Lozier Purchases for the purpose of reopening the company. For a short time, they were successful, but eventually the company was put to rest. The plant, Plattsburgh plant was sold at auction on May 25th. There were no lamentations, for the death of the car of excellence had died long before. Some speculators believe that Lozier might have lasted had production been limited to the Adirondack community of Plattsburgh. The story is not over yet. By the way, this is a 1913 Lozier in a Russian automobile museum, or military museum. And uh, this is the left drive car. We'll just go cycle through a few of these. This would have been one of the last of the, this is the Type uh, 72, the uh, lighter 6. And there's a 1914 Roadster. This is all 1914 models. Beautiful details on these cars, and this is our 1914 uh, Lozier that we have on, uh, that we own as part of the museum's uh, uh, inventory. And this is the 1915 Lozier, which I will tell you, finally got back into the museum on, on Saturday, and that both cars are on, they're not both in the display area, but they're both on display. This one's on display right now. The story is not yet over. By the way, these are the details of the 1915 <laughs> model. Uh, automatic oil level, you just look at it, you can tell how much oil you have in your engine. Uh, air, onboard air compressor, what, whenever have you ever heard of that before? Oh. Hydraulic shock absorbers. So these are you things to, that... You had to swap tires quite a lot. Oh yes, quite yeah, tires were terrible spare. back in those days, yeah. Uh, this is the only other 1915 Lozier. The burgundy one that we have at the museum is the other one. Uh, this car was actually in a, fell off a train, and it was laying on the side of the tracks in Mississippi for a ton of years until it was finally discovered what it was. Uh, they were going back, the railroad line had been abandoned, and uh, somebody discovered this pile of junk was sitting there, and they flipped it over, it was upside down, and it is a 1915 Lozier, they can tell by the numbers. Uh, they didn't have any bodywork, so they did this as a roadster. There were no Lozier roadsters in 1915. So the bodywork is not authentic, but this is the only other car that exists today. Okay, so um, 1916, the story's not over yet. Harry Lozier was upset that the board of directors and stockholders had taken his decidedly luxury car market, a car, luxury car down market. Harry formed a new company called the Hal Lozier Company in Cleveland, Ohio. The prototype was a, had a large V12 engine. You see what he's doing? Cadillac's got a six, a V8. Now he's going with a 12-cylinder. And a prototype appeared where the first Lozier was shown, the New York Auto Show, in January of 1916. And this is the car right here. The car was called the HAL 12. Production of the $2,100 car commenced that summer, although the price would eventually rise as time went on. The company was located in the former World, World Tourist Factory. Harry Lozier left the company in the fall of that year due to health reasons. The company was renamed the Hal Motor Company. Company brochures stated that even though the engines were rated at 40 horsepower, they actually put over 70 horse and at 2,000 RPM and 100 horsepower at 3,000 RPM. Among the prominent owners of the larger of the Hal's were Warren G. Harding. Um, I'm sorry, were Warren G. Harding. Harding. Uh, World War I resulted in material shortages which affected production and Hal was petitioned into bankruptcy of February of 1917, and assets were auctioned off. Henry Abram Lozier died. Oh, here I go again. Uh, Henry, oh, oh, this is another picture of the car. Not a great picture. There's not many of these around. So this is the Hal 12. Uh, Henry uh, uh, Abram Lozier Jr., or Harry, died one day after Christmas uh, on December 26, 1926, at the age of 59. Now, um, Lozier cars were large, comfortable, powerful, with elegant design, and with the mechanical excellence of roller bearings and every possible rotating part, very expensive to build, and were marketed as legitimately high-priced, as was Lozier, Lozier advertising. The company was, uh, reputation was held in high regard. Uh, the slogan was, just ask the man who owns one. Now, I've got a little bit of a postscript here. I'm going to show you. This is uh, Henry, Harry, uh, Henry Lozier. This is his grave. Uh, which is in Cleveland, the sun is the, the previous one. 
Now, um, one piece of information after this last lecture, I found out that all the car bodies were built by the Quinby Carriage Company in Newark, New Jersey. This is a photograph of the company. They built some of the finest automobiles in the world. You could have a Rolls Royce chassis sent over, launches, Fiat's, all these chassis could have the bodies built by this company. So this is where all the larger car bodies were built up until the Detroit factory opened up. Now, I have a little bit of a problem with that. Remember when I showed you that white car, the red, white, and blue car, uh, that this was built in Detroit in 1910? Well, this is a photograph taken June the 8th of 1910 of the larger factory. Okay, the, this is basically the groundbreaking, and this is in October 13th. I don't think many cars were coming out here at the factory. So <laughs> suffice it to say that that car was not built in Detroit. It was built in Plattsburgh. Yeah. And more than likely they, they just put, put the license plate. They probably did. You're right. <laughs> so this is just a little additional information. Yeah. <coughs> here is, I discovered, Holy I was going through, uh, looking through uh, Google, and I Googled some information on the Lozier family, and a bunch, this picture came up, and I'm looking at this thing. It's like, what the heck is this thing? And I was looking at the building, and I looked at this truck, and I, just to tease you a little bit, I have all the pictures of this truck, close-ups included. Uh, this I found at the Detroit Public Library. Uh, all the photographs, this is the one and only Lozier truck prototype. It was a five-ton truck, and it, this was not built in Detroit either, because look at the doors over there. Yeah. Does that look like a one-year-old plant? No, it doesn't. That's the Plattsburgh plant after 11 or 12 years of building boats and so on. I believe this truck at least was here in Plattsburgh, built here at least, and I have a whole bunch of photographs. Now, this is an aerial view of more in modern times, and now you can see there's still a few things that are confusing here, but you can see this great big uh, operation here. I don't know if they relocated the power plant over here to this. Uh, I don't know for sure. I do remember years ago when I was a kid, I remember the big stack, which was there. Yeah. Now, this is the original house, so this was the original factory, uh, factory house at their headquarters. Uh, now you can see Barker Street is probably paved. It looks like it is. Cumberland Avenue is not. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but anyway, this is a, a picture that I acquired a little bit more modern, and here's an even newer picture, and now you can see that the house is gone. Yeah. Uh, the house now is gone and replaced by the current building that you see here now, and now you can see the beginnings of, Cumberland, or of uh, Boynton Avenue over here on the side over here. And you can see this other building that was added to the front of the, in the back of mm -hmm. the, uh, the boathouse over there. And you see all this, I'm assuming this is coal, so I'm assuming it was a coal-fired uh, plant at that point in time. Okay, thank you folks very much for uh, coming to the, re to the presentation. Hope you've learned a little bit about Lozier. And uh, I do have a couple things to tell you. Uh, our website is now finally up and operating. And if you want to find out, there's a lot more information uh, on Lozier that we have. I have a newsletter. If you go to the new website, it's uh, cvtmuseum.com. If you go there and look under the Transportation Times, it's a very simple newsletter, but you will see the history of Lozier. I've got a ton more information. Uh, I've, done it, I, I've got six months already prepared now. Uh, I prep, I'm going to put a ton more information in there. I'm going to have photographs that I didn't have time here. As it is now, we've been here an hour and a half. Uh, so anyway, the whole idea behind it is uh, lots of additional information. I've also included... Uh, information on cars. People come to the museum and they'll see a car and I got about two or three minutes to explain it and then we have to move on. The tour <laughs> takes an hour and a half. I go into great depth and detail. So as I go along, at, uh, after in a year or so from now, you'll be able to look at all the cars and all our exhibits in great detail. Uh, and there's some other things there too. Uh, we have, uh, if you want to know, uh, just interesting things like in 1915, uh, what did things cost? Uh, what were the price of cars and so on? That's on there too. So I encourage you to go to our website. Uh, so, we thank you for coming, and thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions uh, now? That, hour, uh, yes. hour and five. In the early days of automobiles, did one have to have a license to drive? Were there posted speed limits? Mm. And when did insurance come in that you had to have insurance? The insurance one I can't answer. That I absolutely don't know. Okay. Uh, the answer is that... Um, Originally, there was no license to drive. Okay, that came up state by state. This is back when the states had power over these kind of things. Mm -hmm. The only thing that they did do, they realized that they needed a source of revenue. So what they did do, they required you to have a license plate. And what they did, almost all the states would issue the number, you had to get your own plate. So there were little companies coming up that made the license plate. Some were actually made out of leather. So that's uh, another thing I can answer there. 
there was, uh, I show a film uh, at the museum uh, taken of uh, four days before the San Francisco earthquake of San Francisco with cars, it was mayhem. No stop signs, yeah. no crosswalks, no nothing, and it's just bedlam. Cars are running every which way, passing each other on the right. There was a speed limit of five miles an hour. Now, they didn't have radar, so how they got the, how they gave a ticket, I don't know. I would assume they probably watched somebody doing something. Uh, so, I, that, what was the other question? Insurance, I can't answer because okay. I don't have a clue on that. I know the first automobile accident occurred in New York City. Uh, the car was a Duryea, and he hit a bicycle and ran over and injured the man, and he got sued. An attorney sued him. That's the first recorded auto accident that I know of in the United States. What, what yeah. Year? Uh, that was, um, I believe it was before 1900, probably 1898, I want to okay. say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if, I look, if I looked at an old picture of a car, how could I tell if it was a Lozier or another car? I mean, Very how difficult. Easily? Very difficult. Like sometimes I see the name on it. Well, the Lozier cars did have a lot of them. You know, some of them had the name right out there, Lozier on the front yeah. of it. Uh, there was a shape of the grill they had. Uh, they were kind of, they were tapered, so you started from the top, it was rounded, and they kind of went out at the edge and then around at the bottom. But to be perfectly honest with you, I tell people, monkey see, monkey do. When you come to the museum, and we, we go all the way from our oldest cars, 1909, as we go up through all these cars, there really wasn't a whole lot of changes. Even right drive, think about it. I mean, they, in England it was great because the, the passenger got out on the curbside in England, but every other country, it's just the way they did it. Nobody wanted to change. I don't know what the purpose of it was it's just that when you're selling something, you're successful, why break the mold on that? I guess that's what I came up with. Now, there were changes as they go on. First of all, the early cars had the wheels out of the corners, if you notice that. Look yep. at all your old cars. Uh, and the car was kind of like a, a swung in between those. Mm -hmm. We got to, I have a 1960 Cadillac that has almost seven feet behind the rear wheels out of the big tail fins and another four feet in front of them. So we went to the opposite direction, and now what cars are doing, if you look at the cars now, we're going back out to the corners again. So there were trends and... Well, I've seen a lot of pictures of old cars. Yeah. You know, 1905 to 1911. But I, I still don't know how to identify that versus, you know, the 20 other car. It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. In fact, uh, one of the unique cars, there's, I, I will show you, when you come to the museum, uh, we have a 1927 Pierce Arrow. And George Pierce uh, was, uh, he, he started his company in Buffalo, New York, another Buffalo company. Uh, he started his company, uh, and in 19, uh, 1909, uh, he became kind of famous because he's working at his factory, and uh, on the third floor, he's doing his paperwork, and he notices a bunch of cars pulling up. Uh, so he called his secretary down at the main desk, uh, who are these people? I don't have anybody listed. And she said, uh, sir, I don't know who they are. I'll be with you in just a minute as soon as I find out. Well, I got the curiosity to him, so he goes downstairs. And uh, at the bottom of the stairs, she's standing there trembling. She said, sir, the President of the United States, William Howard Taft. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what brings you here, sir? He says, well, I'm here to buy two Pierce Arrows for the White House. We only have oh, steam-powered cars. I want gas-powered, and we drove driven one. But I want, of course, you probably know he was a very large man, so they custom built the car for him, two of them for the White House. That's the first thing they did. So the, the Pierce Arrow was on the map already. Mm -hmm. The second thing he did is he was at the New York Auto Show in 1914. And while he's at the Auto Show, he mentioned to his chief engineer, look at these cars, they're all the same. Exactly what you're talking about, sir. The cars are just like the cars today. Is it a Camry? Is it a Hyundai? What is it? So what he did, what Mr. Peer, the engineer did, he put the headlight on the fender. This had yeah. never been done before, and we have one of those cars. That was patented by Pierce Arrow starting with 1914, and it would have run until 1934, except they went bankrupt in 1933. They were actually bought out by Studebaker. So that car would be the only car you would see that, wow, that's a Pierce Arrow. You can actually tell it. If you go to the Saratoga Museum, they also have a Pierce Arrow there with the headlights on the fender. It's a shrouded... Yeah, Lamp. so it's in the started right into the fender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the this was the one. beginning of unusual things, but again, you have to be brave to do this kind of stuff. You can't just do it. You, uh, at least they didn't want to. What was the company you said that made the, the bodies? Okay, the, the Quinby company. Quinby. Yeah, okay. and, well, I found that totally by accident. And again, I was looking under something else. This is what happened. Now, would this be a company like in competition with... 
body by Fisher? No. That come well, in? it would have been kind of like that, except Fisher was Detroit. But yeah. what they did originally, they built, they they served the New York City upper crust market for coaches, like these real fancy horse-drawn coaches. And they were just okay. outdoing each other with gold and trim and brass and coach lanterns and velvet upholstery and all this kind of thing. And uh, if you, you can look it up if you want to go, you'll see on, online a number of the cars. That's the only photograph I have of the plant. Uh, and you see the pictures of the cars and, they, and all of the finest European cars, including Rolls-Royce, eventually used them for the American body. It's very difficult to ship a car over. Uh, it's very expensive. So what they did, they shipped the chassis over. This was quite common to have custom chassis. You could buy a Packard and ship it to Ralston or one of these other companies, and they would put a custom coachwork on there for you. So Rolls would be shipping Mercedes ship cars over here, and they all, most of them went to Quimby. And Quimby put these beautiful, very elaborate cars, and they were quite different from each other. I will say one thing, those were really different. Dick, have you ever uh, seen the Piercero bus that's up at the uh, Miner Farm? I haven't, no. I've seen them before because there's a Piercero Museum uh, at at, in in uh, the one at the um, Gilmore, there's a Pierce Arrow. They have a Pierce Arrow truck there. I don't know if there's a bus, but it's the same front end on it. But they have a Pierce Arrow Museum. Uh, the Gilmore Museum, if you ever get a chance to go, it's uh, it's just south of Detroit. And what it consists of is about 1,800 acres. And there's a Cadillac Museum. There's a Ford Museum. There's a Lincoln Museum. They have one for the uh, the classic car. Uh, Club of the United States, where they rotate cars in and out, um, and that's where I saw that white loader. Uh, that's the car from uh, from the uh, Titanic. I call it the Titanic car, but <laughs> <laughs> it's still running. Still run. It still is, and it's still running. Yeah. Yes. When did they have trolleys in Plattsburgh? From when, Probably, when to when? Uh, Eighteen ninety-five to nineteen twenty-nine. I never see pictures. Of them. I brought them at the museum. Okay. As a matter of fact, yeah. In fact, the lady called me up uh, last. Do they have trolley cars? Do they? We had we had uh, there were eighteen trolley cars. Uh, there were nine open and nine closed. Uh, nine were for the summer. Nine were for the climate weather. Uh, they were located right on U.S. Avenue yes, over I here. Know yeah. Where, yeah. Uh, and the thing is, the the funny thing was when they bought them, uh, I remember there was one car they bought and put out on the road. Nobody would ride it. That was car thirteen. Uh -huh. So they ended up with an odd number. They changed it to car seventeen. <laughs> And we also have some models of those trolleys uh, in my diecast for a model room I have. I have uh, actual models of them. And where was its terminus? Where was its beginning? Where the well, the cars were kept. Well, they ran, uh, they ran, of course, again from U.S. Avenue. They would go south right along Route 9 here. But once they got over to uh, Elizabeth Street, they went over on the west side of the road. They didn't go down the center. They were in the center right up to that point. And then they ran on the west side all the way out to the Champlain Hotel. They actually came right up to the front of the hotel, and they would have a leisure car pick them up to bring them up there. There were coaches before that, horse-drawn coaches. Uh, and then going north, uh, they would head, again, past here. Uh, they turned, uh, I don't know the name of the street, where the traffic light is right now. That traffic light that's all jammed up to the Kennedy Bridge there. I don't know what that street is, but they went to the right right there. Pike. What's that? Pike Street. Pike Street. And then they made a turn, and they came out at the, at the, um, the Fouquet House. They stopped okay, right there in yeah. front of the Fouquet House, uh, where they'd pick up passengers there, and I think they went around, and then at the bus station, or at the train station, they went all the way up, uh, up uh, mm -hmm. Bridge Street, and then they made a turn. Uh, one would go to the right on Margaret Street, and it went right up to within a block of the Lozier plant. It didn't, because Boynton Avenue wasn't there. So they made a turn just before that, and I brought all the workers there, and it went west, um, I don't even know what street it would have gone up, I'm not sure, but it went up to... Where the college was, I guess, uh, uh, the, that would have been the outer part of the west end of Plattsburgh, yeah. made a turn and came down Brinkerhoff Street. Okay. So I came all the way back and met the city again. And then there was another loop, I think, I think Broad Street. It went up through Broad Street somewhere. There was a loop up through there. Again, I got a diagram. A lady called me uh, last week, and she's got her grandfather worked for the Delaware and Hudson Railroad, uh, and she's bringing me a fan that was on his desk right here in Plattsburgh, and she's bringing her father, I think he first worked for the Plattsburgh Traction Company, uh, and then he, uh, when they went under, he went to work for the Delaware and Hudson. She's bringing me his conductor's hat and donating it, so we'll have... 
I don't know much about Kelly. So is there a central power plant for that? The, there is. The city would have been providing the power. Uh, okay. And it's, they're making that, that awful mess you see. That, what's the name of that little street here? They've got a mess at the bottom of that hill over there, oh, uh, near the river. Where the coal gas. That was the coal. Yeah, yeah, it was coal to, it was a coal plant where they made the power there. Okay. Trouble is, they were marginal. That's why Lorger was hesitant to come here, because Plattsburgh didn't have enough electricity. Mm -hmm. So he produced enough that the city bought electricity from him. Uh, and the trolleys, uh, and they were overhead wires. That's, yeah. the, that's how they got the power. And of course, it was down to the tracks. That's how uh, the power mm -hmm. would come back. But yeah, it was... Uh, Mass transit was very good. The problem was it was very, very expensive to put down. Mm -hmm. And they went down the middle of the road. So once cars started coming, you had to watch out for these trolleys. They were always in the center. And if you wanted a new route, it was a whole lot easier to get a gas-powered bus and go where you want. Mm -hmm. Instead mm -hmm. of tearing off the tracks and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I remember tracks on Cornelia, uh, Cornelia Street when I was a kid. The, uh, there was cobblestone. With Cornelia, they had never tore the tracks completely up. They paved over the cobblestone, and they all started tearing up. They all started coming yeah. through. And I can remember you could see remains of the trolley track in it. They're yeah. probably still there. Probably are. I don't know. I don't know if they ever did tear them up. You ever driven on Cornelia? Yes. Do you know how many people the plant employed? There were. Um, I believe 600, between six and 700 people at one point in time. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit more at one point when they continued with the marine engines. So they had marine engines going and they had the car engines and the car chassis and all that. So at that point in time was their peak and I think it was between around 600 people total. Was there shift work? Was it the 24? Yes. Well, shift? I don't think it was 24, but I think it was two shifts. Okay. Yeah. And some, in some cases they did, uh, like they used to do painting and stuff, would often be done at night. Uh, it's because of the paint spray and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know about the shifts. I don't have I don't have a list of the shifts or anything like that. And the, like I said, the limit was between five and six hundred cars. By the way, there's three thousand eight hundred cars built. Forty three exist today, and we have two right over here next door. Wow. For you to see. Yep. Done good. So they're quite a rare car. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was Dick Soper talking at the Clinton County Historical Museum, and he came here from the Champlain Valley Transportation Museum, and there's where the lozers are stored, just a stone's throw away here from the Champlain, from the uh, Clinton County Historical Association Museum, all part of the museum complex here on a former Plattsburgh Air Force Base. Thanks for watching and supporting viewer-supported local television, hometown cable. TV, we think, is worthy of your support. Thank you for watching.